Profit is brought to you by StopToShop.com, your ultimate source for Pokemon singles, tins, boxes, and cards from a variety of other games too. Type in the coupon code PROFIT in caps with a dash and you'll sweeten the deal with a 10% discount on your full order. If you're looking for cards, make the stop at Stop to Shop. Hey everybody, and welcome to today's episode of Profit. Now, I know it's been a little bit longer than usual since my last episode. I've had regionals, I had spring break, I had the black and white pre-release. Now I've got finals coming up, so I'm falling behind and a lot of news is happening. Got a lot of different things to talk about, so I was uh, kind of trying to decide what would be the most important thing to tell you guys. So, I finally picked up my topic. I'm going to talk about everything at once. It's a lot. But I'm trying out a new format. We'll see how much information I can squeeze into one episode while keeping it entertaining. So um, let me know what you guys think about this format, and let's get to it. Check it out. I returned to Missouri for the regional championships in an attempt to become the defending champion. I ended up bringing Lock Shop again, actually the exact same list that I brought to Week 2 Estates, in an attempt to try and win with Sabalock for two years in a row. Now the day before, Vince, the tournament organizer, held all kinds of side events. I got mostly footage from that because the next two days I was playing and I wasn't really able to use my camera that often when all my games pretty much went to time. So I had a great time, there were a lot of stuff with the new black and white cards, the theme decks, and it was just exciting to see everybody again. But enough about that, let's talk about the actual tournament. Now I had trouble falling asleep the night before, so it was pretty bad in the morning. I was a little cranky, but I wanted to do well. My rating was set for a world's invite at this point, so I didn't really want to lose too many games and drop too many points, but after getting two seconds at states, I felt pretty confident about the format, and I was good to go. Game one was against Luxchomp, and it is honestly the biggest misplay I've ever made in the tournament. So basically the game starts, I take a huge lead, I'm disrupting, and eventually he starts coming back as we come to time. We end up getting 1-1 to -one in prizes, and I have the game in my hand. He's got a Dragonite active with damage counters on it. All I have to do is attach an energy gain to my Garchomp, Claw Swipe, and that's the game. Unfortunately, due to me being tired and just losing focus at the end, I had a one-track mind and thought that the only way I could win was by doing a Dragon Rush. The only way for me to do this would be to move an energy by using Galactic Switch. So, I announce it. Unfortunately, Bronzong had 7 damage counters on it, so, I lose the game on myself by Galactic Switching, knocking up my own Bronzong, and giving Vince the win. It was a pretty disappointing loss, and definitely a horrible way to start the day when my rating's on the line, but I decided to uh, just run to the bathroom, splash a little bit of water in my face, wake up, and continue to try and dig myself out of the hole. Game 2, I played against a Disruption deck with Weavile and Sableye. Turn 1, she goes absolutely crazy. Drops broken time space, drops 2 or 3 Weaviles, gets double heads on initiative. I think she drops my entire hand to 0 on turn 1. Unfortunately for her, I top deck Pokemon Collector, I'm able to get Uxie, and set up and win. It was kind of interesting. Her deck was really good at disrupting, but it didn't really have an attacker. She just kind of relied on the Weavile, so it was uh, pretty good for me. She beat me at Missouri States last year, so it was nice to beat somebody who's beat me earlier. Game 3, I played a Pokemon with Vilegar, and things just didn't go well for her from the start. I ended up taking about 4 prizes in a row with Sableye, while she really didn't have a supporter to set up. I take the last prize with Honchkrow, and I'm moving on, 2-1, to Game 4. Game 4 is against a Dolga Chomp, and he actually started out really well. He got a belted Dolga with 2 special metal on it, and he started taking prizes pretty quickly. Unfortunately for him, I just had a really good hand, set up a Honchkrow, Special Dark, and Flash Bites, and I'm able to deal the 150 damage that I need to knock out his Dolga G level X with my Honchkrow. I think Honchkrow ends up taking all of my prizes that game, and he just isn't able to come back after I KO his main attacker. So, 3 and 1, on to game 5. Game 5 is against another Dolga Chomp, and I'll be honest, I just don't remember much about this one. I remember playing Twins after he took the first prize, and just taking over with Garchomp and Honchkrow. Game 5, I played Magnezone Regirock, one of the biggest emerging decks from States, but I had played it all the night before, so I was pretty prepared. Basically, in this game, I ended up drawing very well off Judges, and I set up a Honchkrow that was able to one-shot his Magnezones. You couldn't really do anything about it, and I move on to Game 7 at 5-1. and one. 
Game 7 was against Colin Peterick's Gyarados with disruption cards, like Cyrus's Initiative and Shadot Gene. Unfortunately for him, he didn't have the fastest start, and I'm able to take off with Lux Rays and Lucario before he can come back. I don't remember too many details, because we ended up meeting again in top cut, but I was able to take the win fairly comfortably, moving to 6-1. and one. My last game was against a Steelix deck, and it was one of the weirdest wins I've ever had. I started Murkrow, attached a double to it, and passed. On his turn, he puts down an Onyx, belts it, and that's all he's got. On my turn, I'm able to set up a full bench, Flashbite, get out Honchkrow, and Riot for the turn 2 win. I've never really donked with Honchkrow before, and I felt kind of bad about it, but I was kind of worried about my Steelix matchup in the first place, so I'm happy to win that one. Top 32, I ended up playing a Luxchomp player that I actually played in round 7 of Swiss at Regionals last year. Game 1 and 2, I can't exactly remember because they were pretty similar, but they both involved him taking an earlier lead, usually using Roserade, me using Twins and setting up, and beating him after that. Game 1 was actually pretty close, and Game 2, he just had a pretty bad hand. Moving to top 16, I ended up playing Colin Peterick's Gyarados with Disruption. Once again, I can't remember too much about these games, but I ended up using Luxray and Honchkrow a lot to take most of my prizes. Unfortunately for him, he hit so many tails, it wasn't even funny. There was one turn where I think he hit five tails with Super Scoop Ups and Junk Arms. It was crazy, I feel bad for his horrible luck, and I ended up moving to top eight. In top eight, I played a Scissor Magnazone deck. Now, I felt pretty good about Magnazone, but Scissor's one of the worst matchups my deck has. I run so many special energies, and no real hard counter. Ever since I started running Luxor instead of Blaziken, I haven't really been able to do anything about it. Lucky for me, game one, she has horrible, and I've got great. I end up setting up pretty quickly, take some prize with the Garchomp, and she scoops, and we're moving to game two. Unfortunately for me, the luck had to end. In games two and three, she was able to set up a Scissor Prime extremely quickly. In game three, I think by turn three, she had a Scissor Prime with four special medals on it, attaching extra special medals using the Magnezone from Stormfront. I can't do anything about that with my deck, and even when I set up Honchkrow, being deduced by 40 damage for every attack was just too much for me. She ended up beating me in three games, and ended up taking second place. The winner of the tournament was Jason Harry with Lux Chomp, and currently, he's number one in the world. Pretty well deserved for a pretty good player. Speaking of high numbers, I did pretty well myself. I'm currently ranked 9th in the world, and I'm definitely on track to get my invite at the end of the year. I'm excited to get you guys some Worlds coverage for profit, and it should be a pretty good time. I started off kind of nervous, losing that first game when I had the win in hand, but I was able to win all my games past that, all the way up to top cut, for a solid 9-2. and two. The regionals results didn't really add too much that we weren't expecting. All the decks that won at states ended up winning at regionals, including Lux Chomp, Magnezone, Sableock, Dalga Chomp, Gengar, and Gyarados. However, one new deck was added to the format that only saw one state's win and had relatively unspoken hype. This deck was Machamp with Vileplume. Interesting about the deck is that it usually runs a 2-2 or even a 3-1 split with Machamp Prime instead of Machamp from Stormfront. The deck had a pretty good showing at our regionals, and it ended up taking several spots to the top 32, ending its run in the top 8. Beyond that though, not too much you wouldn't expect. And that's my recap of this year's regional championships. <laughs> Remember my last few episodes where all I do is complain about how bad the format's going to be if we get Majestic Dawn on with black and white rules? Well, it turns out that Pokemon's been listening, and they actually had an announcement. After not hearing them for about three weeks, I was getting a little bit worried, but the announcement is actually pretty surprising. They say a couple of main things. The first is that we might have a mid-season rotation. This is pretty shocking considering we haven't really gotten one before, but I'm pretty excited, and I'm hoping that we're going to get one. Now, while the rotation might not happen, if it does happen, it'll be on June 1st, about a month before United States Nationals. Now, I know that there's a lot of pros and cons to this, but as a player, I'm very excited about it. Unfortunately, for you guys going to Nationals outside of the United States, which is a little bit earlier than ours, you won't be getting the HeartGold SoulSilver on rotation, and instead, will have to have your organizer deciding what format you're going to play in based on two options. The first is that you're going to play black and white rules with Majestic Dawn on. I'm pretty sure nobody's going to go with that option, 
And most nationals outside of the United States are going to play in the exact same format that we played for regionals. With no black and white rules, but black and white is not released as a set. So your last set will be Call of Legends, and it will be Majestic Dawn on. Now, I know a lot of players are not excited about this because they really want the Heart Gold Soul Silver on rotation, but it seems to be the only option that Pokemon's presenting. Oh yeah, did I mention Heart Gold Soul Silver on? This is a much deeper rotation than most of us were expecting. I myself was expecting Rising Rivals on, because that would only cut four sets like they did last year. Cutting the Heart Gold Soul Silver means cutting seven sets, which, admittedly, can be pretty bad for some people who've been collecting stuff from Arceus, Rising Rivals, and Supreme Victors. However, I'm pretty excited for the format. It means lots of new decks, lots of possibilities, and a format in Worlds where it won't be a total dog fest. Now, the format's not perfect, I'll admit that, but at least it's something different and a breath of fresh air. We're not exactly sure how Pokemon's going to decide if there's going to be a rotation or not, but my current opinion is that they've already been set on having the rotation, and have just used this as a front to prepare players, that way they're not just announcing it out of the blue. I think that that's the smartest way to go, and I'm pretty excited if there is a rotation. Whether or not there is, there probably will be one for Worlds, so I'll be able to play in a format that doesn't have Sableye in every single deck. Let me know what you guys think about the rotation. I know not everybody agrees with me or my stances, but I'm always happy to hear what you guys have to say. Speaking of black and white rules, the black and white set for a Pokemon trading card game has finally been released. I know a lot of people have been excited about this, especially after the disappointment of Call of Legends, and I think it's a very, very good set. Because I've traditionally had a set review before the pre-releases even start, I'm going to make up for them and give you guys a mini review of some of my favorite cards in the set right now. Let's start with the starters from this new region. Superior is like a new Nidoqueen. He's got the exact same body, well, now it's an ability, but it stacks. So if you have more than one superior in play, you're healing 20 damage, 30 damage, or 40 damage in between turns. Superior's only problem is he doesn't hit exactly heavy. Two energy for 60 is pretty good, but it might have some trouble knocking out different kinds of Pokemon. I'm sure there's a lot of partners that could work very well with him as he heals your guys, but for now, I'm not exactly sure how to make a deck with him yet. Embor, on the other hand, is completely broken. Remember Rain Dance, a power that's been used pretty popularly from the original Blastoise and for Alligator Prime? That power lets you attach as many water energies as you want to water Pokemon. Embor's ability lets you attach as many fire energies as you want to any of your Pokemon however you like. This is going to make Embor's ability extremely abusable with cards like Rayquaza Deoxys Legend and Reshiram hitting for huge damage turn after turn. You can also use the Shuckle Blister Pack promo to have built-in draw, then you seek her to pick up all the energy that you just attached to the Shuckle. All in all, I think Embor is probably one of the best Pokemon in the set, and I encourage you guys to get as many as you can before they're hard to find. Samurott? Well, Samurott's just bad. Reuniclus is an interesting tech card that's at least worth looking at. He's really good in tank decks because of his power, which works exactly the same as Alakazam from base set. His power lets you move damage counters however you want to your own Pokemon during your turn. This is really great if you have a Pokemon with high HP that survives one of your opponent's attacks. You can use Reuniclus to move those damage counters from your active Pokemon onto your bench, preventing them from being knocked out and allowing you more time to prevent your opponent from taking prizes. He's not without his downsides though. He's got a really low HP, a pretty poor attack, and a bad retreat cost at 2. However, he's definitely worth experimenting with and I encourage you guys to trade for at least one to try around. Another interesting tech card is Zoroark. His attack Foul Play for only one double colorless lets you use any attack from the defending Pokemon. This can lead to a lot of strange combinations and it could work very well as a mirror counter. For just one energy you could use things like Gyarados's five energy attack, you could Dragon Rush, or you could attack Tyranitar Prime. I'm not exactly sure how good it is because of all these different combinations, but the fact that you have all these options available definitely means it's a card you should check out. Another decent card is Sinshino. I, I think I'm pronouncing that right. It's a card that for one double colorless energy does 20 damage times the amount of bench Pokemon that you have. Hitting 100 damage for one energy is nothing to laugh at, and while colorless type won't be that good in a heart gold soul silver on format, and a fighting weakness to Donphan Prime isn't the best thing to have, He's definitely a fast attacker that could be worth trying out. 
Now I've saved the best for last, and these last cards are going to be huge. The first is Professor Juniper, which has the exact same text as the old Professor Oak, but it's a supporter now. Basically, you discard your entire hand and draw seven cards. I know a lot of people might think that discarding your hand is a pretty big drawback, but depending on the deck, if you can burn through enough cards without having crucial ones left in your hand, drawing seven cards right there is a huge card advantage for just one card. I've tested for Heart Gold Soul Silver on, and I've found four copies of it to be pretty crucial in every deck that I've played. Definitely trade for them while you can. Each of the starter decks come with two of them already, so if you're having trouble finding them, at least you can go there for a start. Now on to the strongest Pokemon. The two main legendary Pokemon from the black and white generations, Reshiram and Zekrom. Let me just start by saying that these are 130 HP basics. That's ridiculous. I thought it was high when SP Pokemon had around 80, or Dragonite FB with 100. But 130 on a basic? It's really, really high, and that makes them hard to knock out already. For starters, both of them have the Outrage attack, which is fueled by two energy of any kind. It does 20 damage, plus 10 more damage, for the amount of damage counters on your Pokemon. With 130 HP, they're almost never going to be one shot, which means damaging them means that they can hit you back for low energy and a lot of damage. Now, let's look at each one individually. Reshiram, as I've already said, works extremely well with Embor. With Embor, you can attach as many fire energy as you want from your hand to Reshiram at any time during your turn. Reshiram's attack does 120 damage for 3 energy, and it forces you to discard 2 fire energy. Attaching 2 more energy with Embor on your side of the field isn't so hard every turn, which means that you're hitting for a consistent 120 damage every single turn. You can also use cards like Energy Retrieval, also in the black and white set, to bring those fire energies back to your hand each turn, and then attach them right away. Reshiram's extremely good, and even its water weakness isn't so bad. When the best water attacker, Kingdra Prime, is actually weakened by fire cards. And the last card, but certainly not least, is Zekrom. His attack for 3 energy does 120 damage, and you deal 40 damage to yourself. This might not sound great, as it drops you to 90 HP right off the bat, but the conditions in which you can attach 3 lightning energy are ridiculous when you use Shaman and Pachirisu from Call of Legends. What you do is you attach 1 energy to Zekrom, then drop 2 energy on Pachirisu using his Pokemon power. Then, drop Shaman, use his power to move those two energies to your Zekrom, and you can deal 120 damage in one turn. Unfortunately, this is something I fear about the game. I've been testing Zekrom for a while, and I've found that you can fairly consistently get out a turn 1 Zekrom doing 120 damage on your first turn. Meaning that if your opponent starts with one basic, you can probably knock it out right away by using Zekrom's attack. This isn't exactly healthy for the format, and I'm hoping that there's going to be more ways to combat this as we continue to test. But, in the meantime, it's one of the most powerful cards, and definitely one that you should look out for. Both these cards come in two versions. The amazing full holo version, which is really rare, and the regular holo version that comes in the set. In my opinion, the full hollows look so much better, but considering they're so hard to find, and the other two are also tin promos, it's probably going to be a lot easier to get these from tins or packs as you pull them. However, if you're a player like me who likes having bling, go for the full hollows. They're really, really cool looking cards. That's my opinion on the black and white set. I think it's great, and you should definitely check it out if you're interested in a set that adds a lot of different cards into the metagame. And last but not least, the Pokemon Trading Card Game Online Closed Beta has finally been opened. Now, I know a lot of you guys have probably gone to PokemonTCG.com and tried out the Trainer Challenge, where you're playing AI and can even punch in some codes for your theme decks if you want to play with the black and white theme decks. However, this mode is one where you can test out features for the Pokemon trading card game online, playing other human opponents, trading, and creating your own custom deck. The way to get into the beta is by having one of these. These are codes that come in specially marked boxes of the Pokemon black and white set. So, you can't really get them at regular blister packs that you find at stores like Walmart and Target. However, at your local hobby shop, you can usually find boxes that mark that say each pack will come with one code card. They come with one of these cards that, when plugged in, can be redeemed for one 10 card pack of any Heart Gold Soul Silver on set for the online card game. I think that this is a pretty cool feature. It means that in the future, we'll probably be seeing these in almost every pack. 
and it means that every time you buy a pack, you'll also be able to redeem that for a pack in the online card game. Now, the actual game itself has been going pretty well. It's down a lot due to maintenance, but I'm willing to wait so that they can perfect the program for when they finally launch it for everyone to use. The format is actually really good. There's a lot of different options for sorting your collection, making a deck, and trading. Now, I haven't been able to play any games yet, but I've heard from a lot of people that the system's going pretty fast, and it's actually really enjoyable. It's pretty cool because it starts you off, and you don't really have many cards to work with. It's like playing the game again as a new player, and it's pretty interesting to collect cards all over again and build decks from scratch. Now, for those of you guys who are having trouble finding these cards, you can buy individual cards on eBay for less than $2 if you just want to get into the beta to try it out. Otherwise, I'm sure if you wait, they'll be having these cards and many more booster packs to come, and the program will finally be out for everybody to playtest the trading card game online with anybody as they please. I think this is a huge step for Pokemon. We've got lots of new players learning the game from a very easy to learn interface online, and soon we'll be able to play test with the perfect automated format. I think the Pokemon's headed in a great direction, and let me know what you guys think about today's new format. I know that it's been a really long time. I think episode two might have been the last time where I was standing here over the entire episode, so let me know what you guys think. I find that it's a little bit easier for me to just kind of free ball my thoughts here instead of reading off a script, and it can help get a lot more information out in one episode. But, again, it's up to you guys to determine what the best format is, so leave your comments in the comment section below. Until then, hope you guys enjoy Black and White, and have a great weekend. Peace!